Chapter 5 of Seeing Darkly. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Seeing Darkly by the Rev. John Sparhawk Jones. Chapter 5 Paul Aboard. Quote, Paul said to the centurion and to the soldiers, Except these abide in the ship, ye cannot be saved. Unquote. Acts 27, verse 31. Plutarch, in his Lives of Illustrious Men, says that Julius Caesar, on a stormy night, crossing a channel in a light, open boat, quieted the alarm of the oarsmen who were ferrying him by telling them, quote, Pluck up your courage, you carry Caesar. Unquote. This great Roman had faith in his destiny. A secret presentiment bade him believe that he was born to achieve a notable career. He was conscious of power, of resource, and had a profound belief in his star. His reported language sets up a striking parallel to the case of the Apostle Paul. Their state of mind was much the same, and their words were equivalent in meaning. In both of these extraordinary men a thorough, deep-seated conviction found utterance, that they did not belong to the common herd of indifferent, routinary persons of no significance and who had no particular errand in the world. This was not egotism, nor personal vanity in either of them. It was a presentiment, a persuasion that they were born to effect something memorable and enduring on earth. This forefeeling has often been a note of forceful men and women. Not infrequently they have had an inkling or subconscious surmise that they were born for some important end, to deliver a telling stroke or act an essential part in the drama of human affairs, and that they were invulnerable until the time was ripe and their hour had come. This has been a trait of large, oracular, and effective natures, and it has naturally operated to relieve them of fear, of anxiety, of doubt, and has endued them with magnificent courage and composure even in perilous times and when men's hearts were failing them. Unquestionably, it is a source of mighty strength for one to feel that he has a work to do, something of value to accomplish, a chief end, that he is not a waif, an autumn leaf blown about by the winds, a seaweed tossed by the billow, an idle, oarless boat adrift on the sea, but that he lives under a providential law and is strictly immortal until the inevitable purpose concerned in his being is exhausted. This, I suspect, has really been the secret strength of great souls, has nerved and sustained them, and made them swifter than eagles and stronger than lions, in the midst of tumults and distractions. Indeed, every one, great or small, needs something of this kind to give him balance and poise, alacrity and confidence to meet the fierce paradoxes of life. We must live from within. We must be fed out of ourselves. We must be guided by an inner light. We must draw from a secret fountain of strength. We must lay at the base of us certain great beliefs, not merely as articles of a creed, but as vital experiences which shall encourage, inspire, and sustain us. Without this, life is a shabby, second-hand affair, lasting by the mere grace of accidents and lucky hits and fortuitous circumstances, snatching frantically at one windfall and another to keep it alive and afloat, devoid of depth, power, purpose, direction, joy, or any great elemental law or principle. Paul was one of the great masculine souls of our species because he had this divination, this strong undercurrent of certitude that he was allied to the god of history and had a part to play in the evolution of a divine plan. At this crisis he had appealed to Caesar from the prejudice and malice of the Jews, who were bent upon destroying him, and was on his voyage to Rome. Both the shipmaster and centurion must have been impressed by his commanding bearing, and that a layman in nautical matters should express such decided opinions without reserve in so critical a posture of affairs as a shipwreck. But Paul was by instinct a commander, one of those whose presence is a tower of strength, to whom others look and upon whom they lean. There are individuals who inject enthusiasm and hope wherever they move. They have self-possession, self-reliance, address, the rare faculty of infecting the timid and inert with their calmness, positiveness, and equality with the occasion. They are able because they seem to be able, and round such the feeble, frightened, and cowardly gather as iron filings are drawn toward a magnet. Paul had the constitutional qualifications of a leader. He was sagacious, bold, and prompt, 
no grain of indecision in his makeup, a man of strong convictions, and who never faltered in giving them effect. These qualities are conspicuous on the voyage to Rome. A passenger and a prisoner, it yet does not occur to him to be officious or meddlesome, to offer his unprofessional opinion even to men who were supposed to understand their craft. With the sure instinct of a great original man, he knows that he is right, and hence counsels the ship's officers to lie quiet at Crete during the season of storm. When, at length, they had sailed into the big, black heart of it and into chaotic darkness, and heard the breakers dashing against the rocks, Paul points it out as the vindication of his practical wisdom and seamanship, albeit he was a plain Christian preacher and no professional navigator at all. The Roman centurion was evidently impressed by the robust manhood of his prisoner and his native force of character. No doubt he was conscious of a sentiment of respect, admiration, and secret homage for the elevated qualities of this obscure but singular Jew. He felt the pull upon him of that ineffable somewhat that makes the heart adore in the presence of a great man, or a great heroism, or a great quality. This appears from the fact that he would not listen to the proposition to kill Paul in order to prevent the escape of the prisoners. Standing at opposite poles from each other, the soldier recognized unusual power, intellectual and moral kingliness, a columnar personality in Paul, and freely accorded him the benefits rightfully challenged by such a character. After all, it is a great advantage to be constructed and put together on large principles. A mighty soul, a strong, clear, fertile mind, energy, insight, a noble nature, a sound mental and moral organization, these are inestimable goods. You need not set a crown on his head. That man is a king already. His supremacy is soon acknowledged. The crowd makes way for him. Everybody stands out of his light. He requires no scepter, no throne. These he has by birthright, not by tactual succession, but by a divine call. Dr. Johnson, hastily working up a fiction in order to pay his mother's funeral expenses, but that fiction, Rasselas, or The Dwellers in the Happy Valley, John Bunyan, the tinker, occupying his leisure in Bedford Jail and producing one of the two immortal works that appeared in the 17th century, one of them Paradise Lost, the other The Pilgrim's Progress, and many another hero in the strife, all go to show that the vital question respecting anyone is not as to his temporal conditions and surroundings, but rather this, what is he fit for? What kind of stuff is he made of? What is the range of his ideas and ambitions? Thus, too, Paul was an insignificant-looking Jew, and all his circumstances argued against him. Nothing in his position gave him right to a hearing, save the one incontrovertible fact that he knew more about that particular voyage and the best way of navigating the Mediterranean for that once than the whole shipload. A sectary, the apostle of a heretical faith, an accused man bound over to answer before Caesar's judgment seat, without money, friends, influence, patronage, high connections, he stood forth on the deck amid the howling of the storm and the heaving of the sea, and the straining and plunging and rattling of this dismantled craft, and all the terrifying concomitants of miserable shipwreck, in the superb composure and majesty of intrepid manhood, telling the affrighted crew that even now, at the eleventh hour, should they act upon his instructions, they would at least escape with a whole skin, if not a dry one. It is a fine illustration of the superiority that naturally belongs to capacity, to insight, to breadth of vision. Ordinarily, every man is the best judge in his own calling, and when a cobbler leaves his last, he falls into trouble. But there are also encyclopedic, polylateral minds who surprise us by their range, versatility, and aptitude. Intellect, clarity of vision, incorruptible stern integrity, moral courage, a moral will, a high-souled masculine nature, lifted clean above all that is mean, petty, frivolous, deceitful, faith in God and in a divine purpose, surely these are winning qualities, the only armor that will stand the test of time, of temptation, of peril, and emerge unhurt from fire or flood. But observe again that the ground of Paul's confidence, under the trying circumstances, was a supernatural suggestion. An angel, a vision of some sort, had accosted him during the night, giving assurance that, as for him, he must stand before Caesar. Clearly he believed in an invisible world of mind, will, and moral agency behind this phenomenal scene of nature. 
Paul believed that personality and purpose reign over the universe, not chance, and that there is possible communion or commerce between the two spheres, of nature and the supernatural, and that finite man may come into a real relation and conference with God. True, the sea ran high, the storm boomed and crashed round them, the ship was falling to pieces, hope had fled, every face was full of blackness and despair. The only blessed ray that shot across the waste and welter came from that strong, glistening angel whom Paul averred he had seen in the crisis of the peril. But that was enough for him. He believed that man is greater than the thunder, the rain, the lightning, greater than the whole realm of physics, that he is not the sport of blind, impersonal forces, but the instrument of a higher will. Paul believed that there is something greater than matter or motion or force, a kingdom of moral ideas, a providential law that could not be drowned in the vasty deep or smitten by thunderbolts. And this doctrine of a moral government, an eternal purpose, running like a thread through all ages, this doctrine that all things work together toward the realization of the best policy for the whole creation, this is, at bottom, the saving clause in our case. Unless this world rests on a transcendental ground, it matters little how soon the Eurocladons rise and blow it to bits. If man have no errand to do in this world, if he be simply born to eat up the corn and to be rolled around with rocks and tombs and trees, if the ideas of God, immortality, duty, righteousness are a mirage, if there be no holy, omnipotent will at the root of things, if time be not the stage for the historical unfolding of an intelligent divine purpose, if God be not gradually working through the slow secular ages toward finer issues and a larger manifestation of himself, if earth and man and the whole nature realm are sprung of protoplasmic slime and have been licked into shape by the eternal, inexorable energy of a blind evolution instead of being mighty shadows flung by an ultimate reality. If there be no moral meaning implicated in man or nature, then the sun may well burn out and the globe stop on its axle. It is absolutely necessary to take into account the throne of God, the kingdom of God, the eternal purpose of God in order even to make the world safe to live in, not to speak of any coherent theory of it. That word of the angel to Paul, Fear not, thou must be brought before Caesar, is highly significant in this connection. Most of the ship's company were sailing from Alexandria to Rome upon their own private reasons and for their respective advantage, and if every soul of them had perished in that driving sea, it is not extravagant to say that the dismal event would not have appreciably affected the interests of the race. But Paul was aboard. Below all the cargo, gains, traffic, hopes, expectations involved in that voyage, there lay a vital consideration transcending them all. For the Christian apostle was connected with an order of facts, and with an historical development, compared with which the commercial ventures of those traders sailing to Italy were the merest trifle. They did not stand related to subsequent history and to the moral education of mankind. Their call to Rome was not in the interest of the new Christian movement, nor in any way linked to the moral progress of the race. Crew and cargo might all have gone to the slimy bottom of the deep on that howling night without irreparable damage to any precious interest or institute the world knows of. But Christianity was aboard. And there is a wide difference in the dignity, value, and excellence both of truths and of men. There are cardinal events, hinges upon which the gates of time turn, and which determine the cast of society and the drift of things. There have been decisive battles in history, of which, had victory perched upon other banners, the civilization, laws, manners, subsequent condition of the world would have been unlike the actual fact. So, too, there have been solitary and singular individuals who have seemed to turn the life of their time into other channels. This contemporary age of ours is largely, if not wholly, what it is because of certain powerful personalities, and fruitful, formative periods antecedent to it, and prodigiously potent and influential that have made it, under God, what it is. The age of Socrates, and later of Aristotle, in Hellas, the age of Julius Caesar and Cicero in Rome, the age of Bacon and Descartes, of the sixteenth century in Europe, which witness the thawing and loosening of scholasticism and authority, the age of Luther and the Protestant reformers, the age of Alexander Hamilton and the framers of the American Constitution, 
and many another age are specimens of formative, prophetic periods that held the seeds of new civilizations and kingdoms of thought, and of cumulative results not yet worked out. Always it is the moral purpose disclosed in the march and evolution of events that is material. The men and things themselves do not amount to much. The men die, and the eras and their contents are rolled up as a garment, but the residual facts left stranded after the tide has ebbed, the new idea started, the fresh impulse given, the new direction in which the currents of human society have set, and the altered opinions, methods, fashions, and spirit that come in, this is the supreme interest. This permanent substratum that underlies the transactions of time is really the significant thing, since it is the unfolding of a divine purpose. Hence, Paul saved the ship, because it was necessary that he should carry the Christian gospel to the mistress of the then known world. The spiritual life of man was in question. The moral exigencies of the race saved that floundering craft in the Adriatic. Verily, it is a tremendous truth that the world stands for the sake of a moral purpose. Groaning in pain, rocking with earthquakes, belching out fire and smoke from volcanic vents, holding within itself in air and in subterranean centers combustibles that could hurl it into the pit of annihilation, the great and gracious God keeps this earth spinning serenely and securely around its orbit, holding terrific energies in leash and under control subject to the gradual outworking of his perfect idea for the children of men. The world with all its plant and scaffolding stands in order that out of the confusion, rubbish, and uproar shall arise a building of God, a civitas dei, a golden age of regenerated manhood, a final symphony out of all the harsh preludes and tangled discords of this present rehearsal. As the case now stands, the world reminds one of yon straining, dismantled hulk on the stormy Adriatic. Seamed with scars, cursed with sin, drenched with tears and human blood, plowed with battle furrows, smoking with ruins, crowded with anxious, pallid faces, the earth has been wheeling along through dark, tempestuous, lawless centuries, some of them so rude and boisterous with carnality and crime that, had it not been for this overruling moral purpose, had it not been that Paul was aboard, that God has in store an immense and magnificent future for the race of man, had it not been for this Christian program, which, when finished, shall vindicate the supreme wisdom and satisfy the highest ideal and challenge the applause of the intelligent creation, there is no reason to suppose that any other consideration would have saved it. What intrinsic value is there in commerce, trade, banking, coal and gold mining, in politics, philosophy or mechanical invention, in any established fact or fixture, to make it worthwhile to perpetuate the human family and save the world from sinking? You cannot find firm footing until you alight upon the continent of moral ideas and the supernatural. All that is bad in the world survives on account of what is good. The selfish, the depraved, the destructive, the obstructive, the animalish, all the vicious elements last only because there is something sound and wholesome left. If there were nothing but corruption and decay, the world would fall to pieces. It is because there are a few grains of salt here and there that society holds together. If there were not a moral ingredient, some pure and high feeling, noble ambition, spotless integrity, heroic self-sacrifice, spiritual faith left among sinful men, the crash would surely come. This imposing materialism and luxurious civilization which men build up and extol will not save society. It is mere splendid rubbish. It is the phosphorescence that glimmers over decaying matter. Apart from character, from faith, from righteousness, from purity, there is no sufficient reason why the world should last twenty-four hours longer. If there be no personal God, no glorious purpose of God, no larger knowledge of God possible, no higher life for the soul, no goal of moral perfection toward which man tends, then what is there in our shops, factories, spindles, turbine wheels, power looms, mechanism of business and banking, or in biology, physiology, and physics, and the whole mundane machinery to keep the world standing? If these be the totality of things, if there are no verities behind and beyond them, if virtue, holiness, redemption from the dominion of sin are not indestructible certainties, if there is no sublime advancing purpose of God leading on the race. In one word, if Paul be not aboard, 
Why should this old earth ship fight any longer with monsoons, or labor through the deeps of time? Observe, further, that although the announcement of the mysterious angel was explicit, and Paul's confidence predicated upon it absolute, yet when the crisis came upon which the whole question of safety hinged, Paul's language was practical and peremptory. In an underhand way the sailors had lowered a lifeboat, under pretext of casting anchor, but really as a stratagem to save themselves and abandon the ship. Paul detected the trick, exposed their criminal design, and defeated it. Nevertheless, looking at this incident narrowly, it appears to carry incompatible ingredients. On the one hand, the absolute assurance of rescue without conditions made to Paul in vision. On the other hand, the imposition, at the last moment, of a very stringent condition, the frustration of the seaman's selfish and cruel program. It is obvious that here again crops up the ancient and permanent antagonism between the higher and lower spheres of divine and human agency. The unconditional revelation is made to Paul that he shall certainly go to Rome, and he firmly believes and declares that the event shall be as predicted. But the critical point is that his dogmatic theology does not interfere with his practical seamanship when the emergency arises. I commend Paul's method of dealing with vexed questions in the sphere of religion. His doctrine concerning the nature and attributes of God, the divine omniscience and veracity, serves as an adamantine base upon which to build an unwavering assurance of his personal safety. But mark, he does not push it into an ultraism, a fanaticism, or beat his silly head against rocky mysteries. He listens to the voice of practical reason and declares, quote, except these abide in the ship, ye cannot be saved, unquote. Apart from metaphysical theology and alongside of it, there is also a sphere of second causes and of moral agency and accountability. If the end is foreordained, the means leading up to it are equally necessary. This is the true relation subsisting between the doctrines of revealed religion and the practical duties of life. The doctrines are radically incomprehensible. The nature of God, the mode of his existence and activity, his occupations and enjoyments, his immensity and eternity, directly we attempt to expound these, the mind falls among antinomies and contradictions which will not surrender their secret. It results that our human knowledge is chiefly of conditions, of secondary and efficient causes, of the properties of things, how they act, and how we are to cooperate with them so as to get the best results. It is not a knowledge of what God is, in the whole sweep and amplitude and affluence of His glorious nature, or why He has made the world as it is, or the mystery of man and of sin on the earth. The knowledge of necessary conditions is our humble sphere, and not a knowledge commensurate with the whole range of being, as when Paul said to the centurion, quote, If you allow these men to escape, we are lost, unquote, notwithstanding my angel and his heavenly message. Hence it is futile for us to pry into arcana and hidden mysteries, or to inquire, Am I of the elect? What shall be the fate of heathen? Are there few or many that shall be saved? Shall I know my friends in heaven? And much else of the same kind. The right question is, Do I comply with revealed conditions? Do I pray? Do I try daily to come into conscious relation with the Father of Spirits through Jesus Christ? Do I abhor that which is evil? What are my tastes, temper, habits, choices? This exhausts our part just now. Our part is to believe, to obey, to do, to live up to the line of our light, to keep open the sluices of moral sensibility, to beat down Satan under our feet to keep conscience alert and keen and get our horizon widened and rolled back, and meanwhile to leave what lies hopelessly beyond the reaches of our souls to an ampler day. There is in man the speculative reason and the practical reason. The one is critical and prying, seeks out final causes and hidden origins, and gets only a moderate satisfaction at present. The other is articulate, peremptory, positive, and says distinctly, Quote, except these abide in the ship, ye cannot be saved. Unquote. It does not curiously inquire how prayer affects the mind of God. It says, ask, seek, knock. It does not inquire why God has chosen to reveal himself by an incarnation and by the cross and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It simply accepts the transcendent fact and acts upon it. Take Paul's practical logic into your life. He knew two things. One, an inflexible certainty that could not be annulled, the other a plain, practical duty that must go along with it as its complement. 
nor did the two clash. Each stood firm on its own proper ground. So, too, do ye be assured that there is nothing in the mystery of God or in the nature of things to excuse from conscious duty. Duties are ours, even though the doctrines and reasons that underlie them be obscure and unintelligible. End of chapter 5《Chapter Six of Seeing Darkly》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org.《Seeing Darkly》by the Rev. John Sparhawk Jones《Chapter Six: The Value of the Soul》Quote, Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death, and shall hide a multitude of sins. Unquote. James, chapter 5, verses 19 and 20. Two men named James are mentioned in the New Testament, one the son of Zebedee and brother of John, beheaded by Herod Agrippa, a record of which is found in the book of the Acts. The other, also one of the original twelve, and surnamed the less, either from his stature or from his age, is called by Apostle Paul the Lord's brother. His language is, quote, After three years I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter, and abode with him fifteen days. But other of the apostles saw I none, save James the Lord's brother, unquote, a kinsman of some degree. It was probably he who wrote this practical treatise to the dispersed Jewish Christians living outside of Palestine, the first of the seven so-called Catholic epistles, because addressed to no particular church, but to the whole body of Christian believers. In any case, he who thus wrote of faith and works to the scattered Christians was a pillar in the young church. Paul found him in charge at Jerusalem on arriving there. He also presided over the first church council with fine wisdom and moderation, and among other services sent forth this tract upon the practical side of religion to the various Christian societies of that age. The tone of his epistle is not distinctly doctrinal. It refers rather to the visible effects of religious principle in the disposition and life of men. He tells his readers what they must do, and not so much what God does for them. He lays accent upon personal accountability and effort, and does not discuss at length the theoretic and reasoned parts of religion. The text which closes his epistle furnishes an admirable sample and summation of his method. Observe there is no reference to supernaturalism or mystery. He does not mention the Holy Ghost. He does not expound the new birth. He looks at the transaction upon the human side, as if it were a service, favor, or accommodation which one could grant another to convert him. Unquestionably there is a permissible sense in which this is true, and by consulting that sense or acceptation James shows the eminently practical cast of his mind. Consider first this fact which the Apostle calls error or aberration and wandering from the truth. It may be of two kinds, speculative and doctrinal, or overt, public, and notorious in matters of conduct and decorum. There are intellectual errors, and there are open faults and sins, and the one does not necessarily involve the other. This is a sphere where there are wheels within wheels. Error may be of all grades and kinds, from that which eats into the core and is critical and dangerous, to that which is superficial and comparatively indifferent. There is a vast amount of error in the world that is practically harmless. It exists in relation to all subject matters. It cannot be otherwise in the present state of man's faculties. More than this, it is one of the proofs of God's goodness to our race that the consequences of necessary, invincible ignorance are not always visited upon us in a painful way and unless this be important in order to secure and protect the larger interests of mankind. Take as illustration the infancy of any art or science in which errors must abound. Absurd theories and bungling experiments and diverse misconceptions arise before the true idea and shortest cut are discovered. Meanwhile, no one is seriously damaged or delayed by his ignorance and awkwardness. It did not interfere with the happiness of mankind before Kepler and Copernicus to believe that the earth was a flat plain, and the sky glass, and the stars spangles, and the antipodes an impossible thought, an inconceivable thing. 
men and women lived happily under the reign of doctrines in geography and astronomy since exploded. So likewise in every branch of knowledge. At first man's efforts are rude and tentative, wild and wide of the mark, but as time rolls in fresh informations this and that is rejected and excluded and replaced by surer methods and truer interpretations. And all the while that men are guessing and blundering and floundering and coming to port gradually, they are ordinarily spared any deplorable, mischievous effects of invincible ignorance. They must err. It is the state of man. He is a trier of conclusions, an explorer, an experimenter, a moral navigator over misty seas into unknown lands. And only in relation to matters where it is absolutely essential that he be right at once and from the start does he receive sharp, instant notification of the fact. For all other knowledge, he waits. If he walk on live coals, he is burnt instantaneously and without mercy, for the simple reason that if the whole race were to take to that occupation, it would be annihilated. If he pass the hand even inadvertently over a cutting edge, it draws blood. If he take poison in sufficient quantity, he dies. It is necessary for the sake of the species that swift, sure, and painful consequences should follow directly and inexorably upon certain acts and omissions, even although they be done in ignorance and by accident. The universal interests of man demand that one and another, here and there, shall suffer as a monumental example, lest the entire race perish through rashness and imprudence. Nature is sometimes a Caiaphas, and says it is expedient that one man should die for the people, and that the whole nation perish not. But ruling out this class of exceptions, God allows error, dense, opaque, stupid, slow-paced error, to take possession of the human mind and only gradually to settle as sediment at the bottom. Moreover, what is true in the sphere of natural knowledge is also true in respect of religious doctrines and ideas. Here, too, there is a wide margin open to innocent and venial error, and such as the moral instinct cannot persuade itself to be highly blameworthy. Thus men may differ touching certain speculative positions in theology without incurring, so far as is revealed, awful peril or immedicable hurt. They may differ as to the apostolic constitution of the church. Was it prelacy or presbytery? Should the church be governed by bishops or by elders? They may differ as to the philosophy and range of the atonement. Was it designed equally for all or specifically for some? And how does it operate to pardon human sin? They may differ in regard to the mode in which man became a sinner. Was it by direct imputation of Adam's sin to his posterity, or by way of natural law and natural consequence? They may differ as to the interpretation of 1 Peter 3.19, and as to what really happened during the interim between the death and resurrection of Jesus. Did he actually preach to spirits in Hades, the dead of the pre-Christian ages? Did he publish the gospel of redemption through the dark and spectral kingdom of departed spirits, and carry salvation to imprisoned souls? So, too, in regard to the whole question of restitution, shall all souls be ultimately restored, or shall some prove incurable and incorrigible and perish? Just as in the previous case of natural knowledge, so here there must be error, taking man as he is, with his limitations, his ignorance, and prejudice. Probably James did not contemplate intellectual or theoretic opinion or doctrinal heresy at all in urging the conversion of sinners. It is perfectly true that doctrine lies at the base of practice, in a general way, and yet one may hold error upon a speculative point, where the light of heaven does not shine full and clear, and where much remains to be said upon both sides, without involving any serious defection in the region of conduct, without lowering the moral tone or implying any desperate hostility to God and goodness. It is rather at the critical point where loose and corrupt doctrine empties, debouches into corresponding evil practice, that the text grapples. Where any one's doctrinal fallacy finds its way into the sphere of action and habitually taints and poisons that, then in an eminent sense he becomes a sinner. Or apart from this, and without any doctrinal theology, one may sin, one may err from the truth, carried along by the force of undisciplined passions, or again one may hold sound opinions without the moral will to give them systematic effect, so that in practice his conduct discredits his ossified orthodoxy. This is by no means uncommon. The picture in the text is presumably that of a person who from any cause has wandered from the path of order and rectitude, and from the ideal of the gospel. 
because there is a definite style of life, a set or ply of the disposition, a certain viewpoint, a general spirit and broad drift characteristic of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that is perfectly distinct and unmistakable, so that it is not difficult to see or to say whether one errs from it. It is not so much a question of intellectual heresy that is here mooted, or some high theme of metaphysical theology which men have not sufficient data to settle dogmatically yet a while, but the picture is that of one who knows more of the truth than he tries to do, who goes astray from it, who leads a poor, mean, shambling, guilty life, and is in danger of making shipwreck of himself, and of being swamped and stranded, from whatever cause. And the Apostle James says, if you can help such, can influence him, can draw him out of the vortex and whirlpool, it may be the saving of a soul from death. Consider further that the text credits men with a singular power of converting others. This is not the usual way of conceiving the matter. The general impression, supported by biblical sanction, is that the soul of man must be turned and tuned and made responsive and melodious under the touch of almighty power. The hearts of men are in the hands of God. Of course, this is the final fact about it, and the last analysis of the matter, but meanwhile divine and human agency are often interactive, so that the inception of religion in the soul may not infrequently be traced to some action, word, incident, or circumstance lying open to view. Now James, with his genius for the palpable and practical, lays hold of the proximate cause, the occasional cause which may originate a Christian experience and lifts that into prominence. Hence he speaks of converting sinners as though it were a perfectly feasible thing. He looks upon the phenomenon from the lower, natural side of secondary causes, and in that view his phrase is undoubtedly justifiable. It is certainly true that one may be the instrument by whom the whole spirit and total tendency of a fellow being shall be reversed and revolutionized. This is a splendid possibility. You may convert a sinner from the error of his way. The Spirit of God may take a man into temporary partnership with himself and allow him to cooperate in an effectual manner and toward permanent and blessed results. There is such a power as personal influence, a dark, secret, inscrutable thing. How, when, or where it may operate or whom it may affect is not matter for prediction. Only this is known, that there is power lodged in sincerity, in moral courage, in moral convictions, in personal example, in persuasion. One needs to handle these things skillfully, for they are delicate, keen-edged tools, and one requires fine wisdom and manifest sincerity to wield them. But there can be no question that many a human being has been deeply and permanently influenced by the spirit, example, companionship, and by the word in season of someone who lived for finer issues and on a higher plane. No one knows when he does incalculable good or harm. This is a great mystery. Out of some little act or omission immeasurable consequences may proceed. Your high courage, your unselfishness, at a critical moment may fling a splendid energy into others. Your word of interest or remonstrance with a blotched, ulcerated bondslave of evil habit may win him to decency and honor. Your silent and steady example may operate powerfully upon those who witness it. Your mere inquiry of one whether he be an attendant upon church service may bring him into wholesome and helpful surroundings. A judiciously phrased opinion concerning the inevitable tendency of a person's course may turn him from the rocks upon which his craft is heading, and where he will shortly strike and go down. You may speak a timely word that shall put one upon thinking about his case, and which shall issue in the passing away of old things, and the incoming of a new dynasty of motives and principles. True, it is quite possible to cast one's pearls before swine. An earnest, sincere soul may do harm by intemperate and indiscreet action. Nothing can take the place of common sense, tact, judgment, a knowledge of men, times, seasons, and proprieties. But with this keen instinct, one may do good, may impart a true impulse, may plant a counsel or suggestion that shall swell, germinate, fructify like a seed. Quote, a handful of corn may wave like Lebanon, unquote. Verily, a great practical truth is this of St. James, that a man may cooperate with God, and that not necessarily with bluster and flourish of trumpets, hunting for a choice spot to set his lever, seeking for a large, conspicuous place as the seat of his operations, and whence he can make elaborate attempts, but simply by the wise use of casual, 
unexpected, wayside opportunities, we may be co-workers with God. No one can say when he shall strike his sturdiest strokes. No one can say what God may wing like an arrow to its mark, and what shall fall short and flat. The main point is sincerity, earnestness. Do not vex your soul about results. Do not draw up programs. Seize and use the opportunity as it comes. Another remark opened by the text amounts to this, that the work of moral influence is far grander than we suspect. Whoever succeeds on this high field saves a soul from death. Here is a powerful argument, yet one we cannot properly appraise. For what is the soul? Is the soul of man matter raised to its highest power and destined to relapse again into dust? Or is it a unique, supernatural somewhat, an immortal property or entity, sojourning here for a season and hence emigrating into other latitudes to clothe itself afresh with an organism better suited to the new climate and surroundings? We cannot define the human spirit. We only know it is that within each one which authorizes him to say, I. Man alone can say, I. He has self-consciousness, personal identity, the faculty of comparison and inference, conscience, and a rational will. He can say, I, I will, I choose, I think, I am. This is his strange prerogative. Brutes cannot rise above the course of nature, but man can. He can take possession of nature and utilize it. Planted in nature, so far as concerns the body, by the force of intelligence, self-determination, and rational motives, he may rise above the nature realm of physics, and direct and control it in his own interest and for his own ends. This spiritual energy, this outfit of mental and moral faculty, this principle of eternity is the inbreathing of the Almighty, and is compendiously called the soul. It is a depth that no lead and line has yet sounded. Men have sounded the sea and measured the velocity of light and the diameter of the earth. They can calculate the orbit of comets and weigh the stars, but they have not guessed the secret of man's soul. They think its Shekinah or center somewhere in the brain and nervous system, but they have not found it yet. It eludes all research. There is a gulf between the brain and the thinker, across which no bridge has been flung so that one may cross from the one to the other. The physics of thought is inscrutable. We only know certain of the goings forth, exercises, and attributes of the soul. It is a sort of bird of paradise, of splendid plumage, but caged, wired and barred by mortality, and that throbs and flutters and hopes and wonders and rejoices. The Bible does not define the human soul. It simply looks upon man as a creature capable of a career. It looks upon human possibility as a wondrous seed that has life in itself, a thing of tremendous vitality, a rough, encrusted diamond that may be cleansed and polished and set to flash forever in the heavens. It looks upon the imperial endowments of man, his insatiable cravings and unquenchable aspirations and all that is as yet potential and small, as capable of fulfillment, of larger life, as being shackled now but one day to be enfranchised and let soar and roam. The Christian religion deals in grand ideas, too grand for our present limitations, Tourists who climb to the summit of the Alps, toiling through the thin air, sometimes sink on the snow and stare in silence at the white peaks and domes and the sea of clouds stretching to the horizon. And is there no majesty in the gospel, too? No Mont Blanc, no Matterhorn, no Mont Rosa, no long ranges, no lofty summits, no shining pinnacles? Can you take in these Christian ideas any better than the stately panoramas of the natural world? Can you define the soul and immortality? Can you tell what it means to save a soul from death? What is the death of the soul? Is it extinction? The suspension of consciousness and all mental activity? The going out of conscious life as a candle flickers and dies in the socket? Is it a perpetual swoon and torpor of the faculties? Or is it an ever-during life at a low pulse in a morally debilitated and corrupt condition, in a dark, indurated, obstinate, incurable opposition to God and goodness? What is the death of a soul? Who shall expound such a mystery? Who can venture upon more than his own private interpretation? Who knows enough to affirm dogmatically concerning such a catastrophe? Verily one would need to take the wings of the morning and fly through eternity in search of materials to elucidate so dark a theme as this. 
even an inspired apostle does not define or describe or dilate. He simply throws out the idea as a vivid, lurid reality. <laughs> a dead soul. A lost soul. Without expounding, he simply leaves it floating before the imagination of vague, nameless horror. And probably in this he sets a wise example. It is sufficient for us to know that a man may lose his career, his destiny, and fail of his chief end. The subject does not call for minute particulars. That the human spirit may fail of achieving its true purpose and fall short of the mark, that the powers of mind and affection and all that fits it to expatiate in the upper firmament of God's love and to discover the secrets of the universe, and to enter upon the companionships of an immortal world may be balked and frustrated and fall down into a deep of darkness and confusion, and become a byword and a hissing, a thing of shame and contempt, surely this is bad enough. There is no need to pile up a massive, apocalyptic imagery to describe so dismal a catastrophe as the death of a soul. Just let it stand as James states it. That will do. That is enough. To attempt more, we should have to draw upon our imagination, in default of facts and of actual knowledge, whereas the Bible simply authorizes this solemn truth, that a soul may utterly, ignominiously fail of its supreme end and proper destiny, and become a wrecked and ruined creature. Surely the ideas connected with religion transcend all others in mysteriousness and sublimity. You may say you do not believe them, but that is a separate matter. Here they are, clear-cut, definite, intelligible, coherent. The throne of God, the soul of man, a life that never dies, moral ruin, an eternal progress in the elements of knowledge, holiness, power, joy, the necessity of divine approbation and of divine help, these are a few of the items that make up religion, and where will you match them for magnitude and grandeur? They dwarf all secular interests. Moreover, this is the strength of the Apostle's argument, that one should exert whatever moral influence he possesses on behalf of men, inasmuch as it is possible he may save a soul from death. He may set some stumbling, shambling foot on a path that shall wax wider and brighter until it lose itself in an eternal day. Is this not a great work? Think of it. One prodigal reclaimed, one frivolous, reckless creature arrested and impressed and made to feel that it is not the whole of life to live. Is this not the highest style of success, to save a soul from death? To meet again even one amid the countless nations of the saved, who shall rise up to call you blessed, who shall say, You led me to eternal life. Would that not be an immense, unspeakable thing to befall you or me? Can you conceive of a greater ovation? Hence, I emphasize the power of moral influence as the most remunerative power we have. After all, the best service you can render anyone is not to make him rich or famous or even learned, but to instruct and stimulate his rational and religious nature. For this, if at all he is to be saved, this is the salvable part of him. The rest is comparative rubbish. So that if they who come into contact with you somehow receive the impression that you believe in God, in duty, in redemption, in purity, in prayer, in moral accountability, in judgment to come, if these ideas shine through your life and make themselves felt, no one may calculate, arithmetic has no logarithms to compute, the possible results of such an influence. It is tidal. It may heave and break upon a hundred shores. It may bless souls who know nothing of its origin and impulse. People are apt to belittle this mystery of moral influence. Nevertheless, it is one of the grand, silent, effectual forces that bear upon the education of the human spirit. If you have accomplished no more than winning a profane swearer from his oaths, or a drunkard from his wine cups, if you have mellowed the prejudices of a strong, implacable hater, or refined a coarse, sensual, sullen nature, if you have made any slight impression upon a strongly entrenched vice or mean disposition, if by the subtle contagion of your better example, or by a golden word at a fit time, any one to whom you have access has had the eyes of the mind opened and been beckoned forward to higher thinking and nobler living, such an exploit takes rank with the capture of a city or the discovery of a continent. Columbus really did not do any greater deed than that, measured by the standards that prevail in the kingdom of the heavens. And while selfish and sensual men may imagine that praying and preaching is a small business, Christianity makes it the chief part of its errand to affirm that such attempts upon man's spiritual nature are infinitely more significant than the din of the street 
and the agitations of the caucus and the noisy clatter of this mechanical world, and that if it were not for man's religious potentialities, his capacity to know and enjoy God and to come into practical sympathy with him, it would not have been worthwhile to carpet a globe like this, arrange its sceneries, and hang its starlights, and marshal its epochs, and ordain its seasons, and kindle sun and moon to give it light, and bid its centuries file past crowded with wars, migrations, tumults, civilizations, creeds, and a ceaseless flux of changes, simply to afford a soulless monkey a chance to play his fantastic tricks. Hence it follows that whatsoever bears upon man's moral life is highly significant. Any impulse or motive drawn from a supernal sphere and applicable to human condition is always in order. If the Christian ideal be not true, it does not much matter how we live or what becomes of us. But if Jesus Christ be indeed the bearer of an authentic message from the unseen to our mortal race, then it follows that man does not live by bread alone, by his animal nature, by his worldly ambitions, by pride, by selfishness, by sensations, but that the imperial endowment about him is the spiritual life, the moral sentiment and presentiment, and his inborn affinity with an order of facts and realities that lie beyond sense, which he cannot strictly verify, but of which he feels the pull and has a divination. If you can do anything to vivify this, if you can fan this spark and make it flame, if you can deepen this suspicion, if you can cause any one to feel that he is a son of God, although a prodigal son, that he is a crown prince in tatters, that he is a child at school far from his father's house getting his tuition, if you can cause any one to live under the dominion of such great convictions, this will be the finest stroke you can do. You need not envy Alexander or Napoleon. You need not care to sit down with kings under canopies and diadems. It will be enough to save a soul from death. But mark this caveat. In order to do that, it is important that one feel the power of the truth he commends to others. It should command the homage of his own nature. Paul seems to teach that God may use a man for what he is worth, without his being worth much after all. My converts, he says, may enter into life, while I may be a castaway. And you can be useful, in a way, without deep convictions. Strange to say, one may be the instrument of the moral recovery of another without thereby certifying to his own sincerity or genuineness. Let us look well to ourselves. Let us light a candle and search ourselves. Every one of us must give account of himself unto God. End of chapter 6. Chapter 7 of Seeing Darkly. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Seeing Darkly by Rev. John Sparhawk Jones. Chapter 7 A Thanksgiving Sermon. Quote, and Jesus answering said, Were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? There are not found that returns to give glory to God save this stranger. Unquote. Luke 17, verses 17 and 18. Leprosy is described as a cutaneous disease, beginning with crusts and scabs upon the skin, thence extending to the tissues and joints, until the frame falls to pieces by a wasting gangrene. It was not an uncommon disorder in the East in the time of Christ and always. One afflicted by this loathsome disease was unfitted for social intercourse, both on account of the hideous disfigurements, the seams, cracks, and ulcers it wrought, and also by reason of its infectious character. It is, therefore, a significant statement that these men stood afar off, this is a stroke of truth and nature, and precisely what lepers would do. They did not intrude into the presence of others without due notice. They knew they were a shunned and isolated class, and regarded with both pity and disgust. In keeping with the general principle, or to illustrate the proverb that misery loves company, and to indemnify themselves possibly for the social ostracism and loneliness incident to their condition, ten of these unfortunate persons, according to Mark's narrative, had found each other and made common cause and common stock. They traversed the country, passing from village to village and picking up any windfall of good fortune that might betide. 
and one day they fell in with Jesus, the prophet of Galilee, in one of his missionary tours. By some sign or rumor they recognized him as the man who had been eminently successful in the treatment of diverse diseases, and invoked his benevolent interference on their behalf, careful, however, to measure their distance and not to approach nearer than custom and propriety would allow. "'Master, have mercy on us!' they cried eagerly, with hearty accord. Whereupon Jesus signified that he did not propose any abrupt break with Judaism. By his direction, quote, go show yourselves to the priest, unquote. This was a provision of the Levitical law, that a cleansed leper must be inspected and passed by a priest before he could return to citizenship or participate in the religious worship and solemnities of the church. He must receive a clean bill of health from the proper official, the Jewish priest. In compliance with this ancient and prescriptive usage, Jesus said to these men, quote, Go, show yourselves to the priest, unquote. This was equivalent to an assurance that they would find themselves cleansed by the time they reached him. Otherwise, he could do nothing for them. He could not sprinkle them with the bunch of cedar, scarlet, and hyssop, nor pontificate on their behalf according to the ritual provided for such occasions. They must be clean before he could certify the fact. And so the affair actually eventuated. As they went, they were cleansed. Then one of them, conscious of the change that had passed upon him and full of gratitude to his healer, retraced his steps to make public recognition of the wonderful and rapid cure, and finding his benefactor fell down at his feet with fervent thanksgiving. Seeing him, Jesus recollected that there were ten in the same bad plight, and directly broke out in the plaintive appeal, quote, Where are the nine? Were there none found that returned to give glory to God, save this alien? Unquote. For he was a Samaritan. The teaching of the incident lies on the surface. It means that man is prone to forget his benefits and mercies, and lays more stress upon what he has not than upon what he has. It is our human tendency to take our blessings for granted and as a matter of course. Man seems to look upon all good things, pleasurable sensations, comforts, even luxuries, as his birthright, upon which he has a natural, inalienable claim, giving him just ground for complaint if he does not receive them. A stroke of good fortune, an agreeable surprise, any desideratum creates only a transient ripple and leaves but a dim impression. Instead of being thankful for it as a sheer gratuity, an extra dividend, the individual only finds in it a reason why he should receive more of the same kind and oftener. This is one of the standing objections and discouragements to almsgiving. You give a dole, a coin of money, to some broken, ragged applicant, to tide him over a crisis, and before many days he returns upon you again. Should you decline, alleging that you have done all for him that you intend to do, all that goes for nothing. You must keep on giving if you expect the wellspring of his gratitude to keep on gushing. Or it may be you are in a position to grant promotion or a larger wage to someone. You decide to do so. He gets the advancement and its accompanying perquisites. After a while a place still higher up falls vacant. He then wants that, but for sufficient reasons you pass him by and fill the vacancy with another candidate. Again, your former benefit is forgotten, falls dead, does not count, is water spilled on the ground. Human nature is so constituted for the most part that if once you begin, you must continue to help it, else the stream of thanksgiving will run scant and shallow, and finally stagnate and dry up altogether. Gratitude is a rare exotic, Small and narrow souls are not equal to the effort. If we philosophize upon the fact, it is owing, of course, to that radical trait of our nature, selfishness. Man is a colossal egoist. Selfishness is the base of him. He imagines that nothing is too good for him, that he has a natural right to everything worth having, that he receives no more than he deserves, and that he is often unfairly dealt with by the overruling providence. This is a general impression. Men feel that they have a natural claim upon God, that he shall make them happy and contented, and failing this, they are prone to grumble, to impeach the divine moral government, and to become critical and even resentful. This attitude, if we may analyze it, undoubtedly results from the instinct of self-esteem and self-aggrandizement, which is a fundamental note of our nature. Men do not generally ask, what warrant had I to expect this good, this gift, this largesse? 
What virtue or quality in me establishes a perpetual claim upon it? What reason had I to suppose that it would last? And this question does not occur to the average man. He takes it for granted, with the air and mien of one who has been rifled of his rights and goods if any curtailment or shrinkage takes place. For substance, it is the story of Jesus and the lepers. Nine of them, as the effect of his order, found themselves suddenly white and clean, and they thought no more about it. They went each about his business. They took it as a matter of course. What use in a recovered leper thanking God when he had only come by his own and returned to his normal state of health, and when lepers were the exception? Why should he not have a clean skin instead of a scabbed one? Who had a better right than he to sit at table, to join in its pleasures and convivialities, to frequent synagogue and temple, and to enjoy life? Could any good reason be assigned why a leper should be cooped up and debarred entrance among his fellows and not stand upon equal terms with other people? The nine seem to have reasoned in this manner, all except the Samaritan. Moreover, it is genuine human reasoning, precisely the same which most men indulge in. It was the opinion of nine lepers out of ten, and it is the opinion of nine-tenths of humanity still that they have a clear and perfect title to all the natural good that comes along. Let the supreme providence take a human being and set him down in the midst of dishes, lounges, perfumes, conservatories, equipages, large dividends, a paradise of splendor and profusion, and then begin to cancel this and that, to cut off this superfluity and that supply, and wipe out another asset, and he or she will be a very remarkable and rare person who does not frown and complain, but maintains a cheerful mood, even although not seriously disabled. True, his roses did not bloom so luxuriantly, and he was disappointed in his pear trees, he had like to have lost his hothouse by fire on a cold night during the winter, and his fast and favorite horse fell lame. A few minor misfortunes befell which did not really infringe the substance of his property, yet he imagines they have seriously undermined his grounds for thanksgiving. And the truth is, the individual has accustomed himself to a fixed scale of living, and to certain fixed, unalterable conditions which have become essential to his happiness, and the consequence is that any limitation or restriction, even in the matter of some artificial and superfluous want, cannot be entertained with composure and is regarded as a grievance. I suppose the truth lies about here, that man living on the earth has good reason to expect food, raiment, shelter, the necessaries of life. It is fair to suppose that the benevolent power who brought him here would not leave him unprovided with the essential things, but beyond this, it would be hard to show that any creature has an indisputable claim upon the Creator for superfluities. Is God unkind to Eskimos and Hottentots, herding together in soot and squalor, in skins and feathers? No, their lives are doubtless contented and happy. Their environment matches their tastes and state of culture. The fact that God has disclosed higher purpose in relation to some than to others does not impugn the divine benevolence, if all have what is suited to their capacity and need. This general tendency to take our good things, our extras for granted, is the feature rebuked by Christ in his query, quote, Where are the nine? Unquote. What cause could even those unhappy lepers show why they ought certainly to be healed under the government of a merciful Creator? Is it not plain that had any such argument existed, Christ would not have expressed surprise at their ingratitude? One is not expected to be profusely thankful for what he has a clear right to have and to hold. Evidently, the whole matter of thanksgiving is settled upon its true basis by this remark of Jesus to the grateful Samaritan. So that if any one is disposed to say he has nothing to thank God for, then thank God that you are not a leper, a blistered, disfigured, offensive leper. Undoubtedly, this is the teaching of the incident. Thank God that you are not suffering from evils that you could readily imagine and concerning which you can show no sound reason why they have not overtaken you. Take nothing for granted. This is the doctrine inculcated by Christ's interview with the lepers. Do not count confidently upon any creature good. Do not conclude that if quails fall in the desert, once in a while, they are intended as a permanent substitute for manna. Do not fail to recognize that men have no absolute claim upon any commodity or comfort under present arrangements in such a sense that they can justly impeach the divine administration should it be withdrawn. Remember that God calls upon us to be thankful that we are not lepers. 
thankful for negative immunities as well as for positive blessings, thankful for what we have escaped as well as for what we enjoy. Probably this is not popular doctrine, and yet it is a direct inference from the surprise of Jesus upon the return of the Samaritan, quote, where are the nine, quote, as if he had said, quote, do they think that the goodness of God is under obligation to cure them? Do they imagine that the universe is tributary to their well-being? Is there any reason in the nature of things why they must get well? Where are they? Where are the nine? Unquote. The conclusion is obvious. Man is a helpless, dependent creature. Proud as he is, he is a pensioner upon divine bounty. He has nothing which he does not receive, and his true and proper attitude is one of humility and gratitude, not only upon high occasions, but as an habitual spirit and permanent state of mind. Doubtless we all lose sight of this fact and of the inexorable conditions of our case. We expect too much. We demand too much. So true is this that when we experience no signal demonstration of divine favor, nothing out of the common, no remarkable deliverance, no splendid success, no cheering tidings, no answer to an earnest prayer, long and vainly hoped for, directly we fall to moping and mumbling that we have nothing to be thankful for. Nevertheless, where are the nine? inquires Jesus. Why shall we not thank God for common mercies, for daily supplies from his storehouse, which because of their periodical occurrence fall round our feet unheeded and are classed as matters of course, like the punctual and unfailing appointments of nature. Where are the nine? Consider further that if there be deadlock, dislocation, disaster anywhere, if one's private affairs are not in a satisfactory condition, if business and money are out of joint, this is largely man's fault, rather than God's ordinance. For the most part, men pull down their troubles upon their own heads. They live unwisely, imprudently, recklessly, from time to time they run into a belt of storms and a low barometer. Depressions, failures, bankruptcies come, but why? The land is full of coal, copper, iron, oil, and the gold and the silver sleep beneath the ground awaiting the miner. The cotton grows as luxuriant as ever. The corn, the wheat, the barley, the grass, the cereals nod and sway in the sunshine and the breeze. The cattle are fattening upon the prairies and skipping upon the hills. The sea is full of fish and the atmosphere of oxygen. The land is not poor. There is always plenty. Where then is the trouble? The trouble, the sin, lies with the people. We talk of hard times, bad times. It is not the times that are bad. It is the men. The times would never be bad if it were not for those who make them what they are. It is human nature, human instincts, impulses, interests, it is human selfishness, extravagance, folly and fraud that make most of the trouble. It is the human creature himself, with his lusts of all kinds, who makes the times good or bad, hard or easy. That large, vague, impersonal generality called society is the prime mover in all mundane changes. He makes the mischief. He creates the panics. He makes money tight or free. He gluts the market and anon raises prices. He produces more than the demand can consume, and suddenly the tide turns, the market ceases, the bubble bursts, his goods are on his hands and he is out of pocket. The hard times did not suspend him, he suspended himself. The world is running at a high velocity. The extension of mechanical industries, the range and power and complicacy of machinery, the discoveries in chemistry, the utilizing of forces and agents not known fifty years ago, the wide outlook opened to enterprise and adventure, the multiplied inventions and implements, and the specialization of work with a view to greater completeness and perfection, all these have conspired to stimulate speculation, activity, expenditure, so that many have rolled up quick and colossal fortunes, and the infection has spread and is spreading. People are grown impatient with small profits and minor transactions. So we see now and then glittering and gorgeous bubbles, looking like pavilions of oriental wealth and splendor, floated down the stream, one bursting here, another yonder, and collapsing at different points. Some grand panacea or patent world regenerator or neat little design for making something out of nothing that had begotten high expectations suddenly goes to pieces, because, forsooth, the times are bad. Oh no, it is not the times, 
It is the silly people who do not count the cost, who do not pause to consider whether the game is worth the chase, who will be rich at all hazards and costs. If any profitable source of revenue opens up, or article of merchandise becomes suddenly lucrative, behold the multitude that rushes in in numbers large enough to swamp it. Whatever the particular sensation or rage, be it the cultivation of a species of rose, or a variety of peach or grape, or the prospectus of a gold mine or oil well, candidates eager to exploit it multiply out of all proportion to their likelihood of success. In the last analysis, it is the love of money, the hunger for gold, the eager pursuit of a purely economic prosperity that throws the monetary machinery out of gear, and begets want of confidence, hesitation, timidity, stagnation. Hence, when you hear that times are bad, there is only one fit reply, only one prescription. Make men better, and begin with yourself. You and I, and such as we are, make up society, the world, the times. They will not be permanently better until we improve. The economic laws are right. The mechanical forces are right. The chemical changes that proceed in plant and animal are conducted properly. The sun and moon attend punctually to their business and rise and set on time. All the natural uniformities hold on without defect. The ox knows his owner, the ass his master's crib. The inorganic kingdom and the vegetable and the animal worlds beneath our feet are all sworn to keep the peace. We cannot go to any of these and complain about the currency, the tariff, taxation, the shrinkage of values, poverty, pauperism, crime, they have no responsibility in the premises. We must knock at the gate of that large, indeterminate, anonymous body called human society, mankind, and ask him why he has been pushing on so fast as to trample on moral laws, why he is so extravagant and dissipated, why he allows organized dishonesty to pile up municipal indebtedness, why he allows alcoholic poison to circulate and run down like a river, why he desecrates the Sabbath and forsakes the sanctuary, why he has not more virtue, more moral courage, more economic prudence, more morality, more reverence, more of the fear of God. I say you must go to selfish, covetous men, and ask them why they have practically abolished God and set up their own image instead, if you would discover the true rationale of the times. We talk about them often as if they were an objective reality, at war with our interests and checkmating our moves, but this is mere rhetoric. The times, good or bad, are ourselves. They are what human passions make them. They are a mirror of sheer human nature, of human ambition, greed, sensuality, of the antagonisms, jealousies, and rivalries of mankind. So that if any one be disposed to say at any time that he cannot thank God because the days are evil and the times out of joint at bottom, this is only tantamount to saying that he is extremely sorry he and the rest are such a shabby set of sinners, so corrupt, slippery, unreliable, untrue. Alas, for our curses and complaints over the distributions of divine providence, the sorrows that afflict us are mostly the fruit of our own devices. Could we return to sound principles, abstinence, moderation, modest ambitions, frugality, honesty, hard work, slow and gradual accumulations, a robust, incorruptible virtue, a live conscience, moral obedience to divine laws, and then methinks every day would be a thanksgiving day. But as the case stands, men are bitten with a rabies for large figures, large profits, fabulous transactions, ultra-enormous incomes. Since the fall of the Roman Empire, it is doubtful whether there has been such an age of frank, unblushing hedonism and materialism as this present in which we are living. The great peril of our time is not the saloon, nor is it the brothel. It is covetousness, the lust for gold, for wealth, and the primacy and power wealth gives, and the luxurious appetites and insatiable love of pleasure it gratifies. This is the dominant danger. It buys legislatures. It is the father of corrupt politics and practices and of official jobbery. It enriches the promoters of lucrative schemes at the expense of a confiding and helpless public. It is at the bottom of pretty much all the slippery sophistry and tricky shifts, the wire-pulling and whispering on the back stairs side of politics, that is constantly going on, of which now and then only a hint and echo transpire above the decent surface of things. Yea, verily, if the times are evil, the world out of joint, and the outlook somber and gloomy, let us put the responsibility where it belongs. 
God is good, nature is beneficent, food plenty, the harvest abundant, plethoric, nothing has gone badly wrong but the human will, the human heart, human affections. Hence, I exhort you, give glory to God. He has done all that is possible to make us contented and happy. If we are not so, it is on account of our own perversity and blind blundering, or that of someone else. Thank God for personal and private blessings, and for immunity from troubles that might easily have overtaken you, for the nameless, unnoticed circumstances of your lot not considered worth mentioning. Thank God that the conflict of ages between good and evil, light and darkness, is ever coming to a fresh eruption, and is still going on with favorable omens that the good shall one day overcome the evil. Thank God for the spread of Christian truth, and that you live in an age of tumultuous fermentation, of revolution and change that is gradually casting up a way for the kingdom of God and of his Christ. Be thankful that you live not in a dreary mill-horse age, but in one where the world seems ripening, when great ideas, great expectations, great activities have taken possession of men, and no one is greatly surprised at anything that happens. For man is no longer looking back to the old Edens, to aromatic Egypt, and grim old Babylon and Persia, with their colossal winged bulls and mysterious sphinxes and flying dragons, those vanquished kingdoms and hoary civilizations of the Nile, the Tigris, and the Ganges, or to the now silent oracles of Jupiter, Ammon, and Apollo. We have transcended that point of view altogether. The world is looking forward to fruitful discoveries, to fresh disclosures of truth, to a land of promise and of peace, of which the milk and honey and Eshkol clusters of Canaan were typical, to the realization of a more perfect equilibrium and order of society. True, things are not so far advanced as the best would like them. There is yet much to be desired, but a beginning has been made. Truth, right, justice, love, great aspirations and ideals have been planted in the world, and a type of divine manhood has appeared in the person of Jesus Christ that can never be obliterated or forgotten. Shall we not then return with the Samaritan stranger and give glory to God? Shall we not be profoundly thankful for the regularity of the seasons, for the former and latter rain, for the bounty of the furrow, for household and family mercies, for personal preservations and deliverances? And lifting our eyes and looking abroad upon the harvest field of the world and the slow and painful evolution of man through the long travail of ages, for man is the only growing and developing creature on earth, Shall we not thank God for the germination and gradual growth of his idea for our race, for his increasing purpose, more and more filling out its orb, for the progressive ripening of history, for the opening doors of Christian activity and usefulness, for the spread of the gospel? Go home, then, and be thankful. Think not upon what you have not got, but rather remember what you have. Face the future with trust and courage. Take your part in the mighty stir of our time. Lend a willing hand to whatever has a scent of good and a savor of salvation in it. Serve your generation according to the will of God, and so make ready for the harvest of the world and the endless thanksgiving in heaven. End of chapter 7 Chapter 8 of Seeing Darkly This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Seeing Darkly by the Rev. John Sparhoff Jones Chapter 8 The Coming Temple Quote, And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. Unquote. Revelation 21, verse 22 between the death of Nero and the destruction of Jerusalem by Titus, the Apocalypse probably should be dated. Internal evidence locates it about 68 or 70 of the Christian era. It was a time of loud explosions. On every breeze were wars and rumors of wars. The horizon was black with storms, and the ground shook under the shock of armies. The Romans were closing round Jerusalem besides being engaged in conflict with the Parthians beyond the Euphrates. Uproar and disorder loud crashes and sharp cries as of a tottering world were heard on every hand, and these phenomena are reflected on the pages of John's Apocalypse. Men were in a high-strung and feverish condition, and especially the Christians of that age, 
for there can be little doubt that they lived in daily expectation of the second coming of Christ and the visible inauguration of his kingdom, which would put a full stop to all the wild tumult and mighty tossings of the time, unwheel the chariots, break the iron mace of war, snap the bows and quiet the obstreperous blast of trumpets, and bring in Messiah's reign of righteousness and peace. It is clear to any reader of the Apocalypse that the age in which it was written was a troubled, uproarious one. The staggering world seemed nodding toward downfall. Lurid lights and awful glooms chased each other over the scene, and it seemed as if the barbaric splendor of mighty Rome would be quenched in blood and all noises soon hushed by the Prince of Peace. So, at least, thought the Christians. They themselves had passed through the fires of persecution, for mention is made of those who had suffered on account of their fidelity to the gospel. The first five Roman emperors were Augustus, Tiberius, Caligula, Claudius, and Nero. These, the seer says, had gone, and as matter of fact the young church had seen a martyr age under two or three of them. Nero committed suicide in A.D. 68. Vespasian took the purple in 69, and Jerusalem fell in 70. Evidently to the Christian soul it was a horrible time. The idolatrous homage to the emperors is broadly hinted in the phrase, quote, the worship of the beast and his image, unquote, and perhaps Nero is meant. John borrows largely, to all appearance, from the colossal, cloudy imagery in the book of Daniel in order to set forth the symptoms and movements of that stormy age. Yet it is not necessary to suppose that the apocalypse was exhausted by the events and revolutions of that period, and that tracts of it may not yet await fulfillment in the evening time of the present world, and in connection with the setting up of Christ's kingdom on earth. Prophecy is large and elastic, and susceptible of more than one application. We do not know how much of John's revelation is still unfulfilled. Time alone can declare that. One feature of the composition, however, is plainly observable, that like all the Hebrew prophets, this one too is radiant with hope. Across the stormy sea of his century John sees light, an illimitable expanse of blue, the red hues of a glorious day that should ride the heavens for a thousand years. Judaism was a religion of hope. All the prophets were hopeful, nay, confident. They were sanguine optimists, sure that God would finish what he had begun, and would never leave the world like a cake not turned. John is of the same mind. In this respect he is a thoroughbred Jew, and agrees heartily with Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, and all the rest. And in this connection, speaking of the future and of a more perfect humanity, he mentions the absence of the Jerusalem temple, as if to point out a contrast between the apparatus of religious worship then in operation, and a nobler worship, a higher, more stable order of things, which he clearly foresaw, in which there should be no slain beasts, no altar, no officiating priest, no ceremonial days, no temple with its portico and Gentile court and gate for proselytes. None of that externalism familiar to the Jewish mind would then be needed, for, quote, the Lord God and the Lamb are the temple of it, unquote. Clearly the language is prophecy. But whether the seer alludes to the heavenly world and sphere of angel and deity, that a state of spiritual perfection which we conceive as lying beyond time, or to a civilization one day to be set up on this planet during the predicted reign of universal righteousness, commonly called the millennium, is not clear. Both views have their advocates, and the only arbiter will be the fact when it arrives. Men cannot agree touching the obvious dogmatic teachings of the Bible, how much less concerning prophecy, which is by its nature vast and vaporous. The Hebrew prophets probably saw the developments of the future as one sees objects in a dream. They took no note of time or order or exact sequence. Details were not marshaled with scrupulous care. The ground was not staked off like a meadow or lot by stiff lines of demarcation. The great features stood out in bold relief and clear as sunlight, but the rest lay in shadow and the prophet did not see distinctly beyond the main interest and the cardinal facts. Hence the ambiguous, misty character of the prophetic scriptures. Facts are set side by side, and seen in immediate juxtaposition, which in point of time are separated by long intervals. Christ describes the siege and sack of Jerusalem, and the end of the gospel dispensation among the Gentiles in the same breath, sliding out of the one into the other without premising that they were two totally distinct histories, divided by centuries, 
so that it has puzzled commentators to interpret them. This is a characteristic of prophecy. It is not a sun picture or photograph, hitting off the exact expression, the brow, the lip, the nostril, the dimple on the cheek. It is rather a sketch in crayon, a rough draft, in which things are indicated by a daub here and a dash there, by heavy or light shading, as the case may be. Such being the genius of prophecy, it is not easy to exhaust it or tie it down to any one intention. For the idea of it is not to write history beforehand, but rather to show the broad drift and trend of the world, the trunk lines along which it moves and the chief terminals and landings to which mankind in their journeyings shall come. This end has been sufficiently answered. The old barbaric kingdoms, with their Tyrian purple, their colossal bulls done in brass, their pyramids, their ivory palaces, their silken pavilions and scepters of gold, have sunk below the horizon, as it was foreseen they would. Jacob, Balaam, Moses, Isaiah, Amos, and other divinely sagacious men perceived dimly that more was to break forth out of God's providence than their eyes had seen. They beheld new stars climbing the sky. They saw stones starting from the mountainside and rolling through the earth, accumulating volume and momentum and crushing the effete things which they struck. They saw gleaming scepters arising out of obscure tribes, and universal dominion passing from the Tigris and the Nile to unborn nations. They saw barbarous peoples holding forth imploring hands for a teaching Levite and for a new law. Beyond the bow and spear and battle they saw that in the evening time of the world there would be light and peace. They beheld a greater prophet than any who had visited them, an invincible captain, a universal king, a finer race, and a better society settled on more stable foundations. Those old Hebrew seers threw out their jagged, disjointed sentences and strong, impassioned words at the finalities of human history. They probably did not see all the niceties and nuances of the situation, but seized with sure forecast the essential items and practical ultimates. They give the net result. They say that the sun will set clear, stormy as the long day may have been. They deal in final destinies and eventual settlements. The Bible is full of this prophetic element. It abounds in the Old Testament. It carried the ethical element in Judaism, insisting upon the spirituality of religion as distinguished from ceremonialism. It was thus a bright candle in a dark, weltering world, raying forth comfort and hope. Moreover, the New Testament is full of prophecy. The miracles of Jesus are prophecies. His words are largely prophetic, even when primarily intended for the purpose of instruction. His resurrection from among the dead is the most significant, stupendous prophecy of all time. The apostles also take up the same strain and flash light upon the undiscovered future. Listen to John, how his imagination wings away into a coming future. He beholds splendid cities, he hears the thunder of mighty orchestras, he sees streets paved with gold, a new social order, a new civic life, a new worship, a new civilization rising out of the decay of old fixtures. When, where, how is not distinctly stated. Only this much. He sees that the radical, universal change is to have human nature as its material and basis, living either here on a renovated earth, or in another sphere, or perhaps in both. Among other characteristics of the new order, he declares there shall be no temple there. Let down in vision amid that strange scenery and all its furniture and appliances, he looked round to ascertain through what methods and institutions the new life of man would express itself. Was it to be like the old Jerusalem, Rome, or Babylon, or any of the old world capitals, of solid masonry and a maze of buildings? And the one thing that struck him most forcibly was this, that he found no Solomon's or Herod's temple, no Aaronite priests, no ephod, no mitre, no processionals, no curling incense there. What does this signify? What but this, that the era is coming in the education of man when the soul will be ripe for a fuller, more voluminous revelation of God, and of the truths which concern him? And when, by consequence, the current modes of conception, of statement, of formal expression, and of consecrated usage will fall away as inadequate or superfluous, because the moral reason of man shall have come closer to reality, and be readier to apprehend it, I remark in view of this prophecy that the arrangements of this present world are only relatively good and are not designed to be permanent. Whatever they be, either secular or sacred, 
they stand related to man's present faculties and needs as though ye now exist, not as they may be modified hereafter. Human life on this planet is not a stable fixture, an absolute, abiding thing. It is a running stream winding through successive landscapes and latitudes of opinion and custom. Incessant and insensible changes are evermore set up. The instrument, method, statements which suits one period will undergo alteration later, and possibly be replaced later still by something that better satisfies the hunger that is in the air, and the evils that cry for a remedy. Hence come all the experiments of history, its revolutions, colonizations, battles, literatures, inventions. They testify to the restlessness of the human spirit, and to the growing mind of man, that the human mind is not a sponge, a clam, a moss on the rock, a sluggish thing of low organization and vitality, but active, dynamic, progressive. All the changes that take place in human society are a reflex of changes in the sphere of mind, and of the steady flux of human thought. So true is this that the men and achievements of other times which we pronounce memorable and heroic would probably have been impracticable and abortive had they been attempted earlier, and would be impossible in our own contemporary age. Luther, Calvin, Hildebrand, Thomas of Aquina, Loyola, Peter the Hermit were fortunate in the time of day at which they lived, and probably could not make so deep a mark upon the popular imagination now. The impulse they gave to the world has carried it far beyond their reach. They are great and potent where they stand, and in relation to the issues of their times. But set them down in the broadways and crowded marts of the world as it now is, and it would directly appear that there has been a silent drift since their date. The temper of civilized man has changed. The conditions of society are different. Standards of judgment, canons of taste, and topics of human thought have all shifted. Men are now asking other questions, and seeking a solution for other problems, than such as agitated earlier ages. This cannot be helped. It is the nature of mind. There is nothing absolutely fixed. If the idea or truth remain essentially intact, the mold is shattered. It is put into other words, illustrated by new information, argued upon different grounds. Thus, if the name of monarchy is preserved, it becomes constitutional monarchy, that is, parliamentary government, government by discussion. If the ideas of God, eternity, retribution, heaven and hell abide, they pass, perhaps, out of gross material imagery into more refined, idealized modes of representation. If the idea of human fellowship springs up, it transcends after a while the boundaries of the tribe or clan, and embraces a nation, later the earth, becomes more and more altruistic, setting up commerce and growing Catholic and humanitarian. These expansions and contractions are constantly going forward, an age of metaphysics and scholastic theology makes way for one of maritime discovery. A century of moral ideas and of religious wars and social reforms is followed by a dreary, mill-horse age of dull work, of money-getting and physical comfort. The ultimate secret, why history unfolds in its observed order, is beyond our analysis. Only this seems clear, that nothing is fixed save the mind and its capacities and cravings. John gives voice to this great fact of the advance of man from stage to stage, when, speaking of some future era, he says that there was no temple there. And if one could imagine himself a literal Methuselah, living a thousand years, a contemporary of ages, he would have occasion to observe how true that is, and by what insensible steps the race of man has passed through successive phases of organization and experience. As he walked down past the world with its crowded centuries and histories, an exclamation of surprise would escape him now and then upon failing to find what he conceived to be deeply radicated and permanent. He would see venerable institutions passing under the hammer, doctrines, usages, laws, industrial systems, philosophies of life and of the universe all showing signs of decrepitude, things apparently made of rock, iron, and adamant, and rooted as the everlasting hills, dissolving in a thaw and passing away in vapor. Standing in the middle of one century, he would say, quote, I saw a universal empire bidding fair to flourish down to the last syllable of time. But a little later I looked, and lo, the nations were casting lots for its vesture and dividing the spoils. Unquote. Standing amid another century, he would say, quote, I saw a universal church, a supreme pontiff, one Christian commonwealth, and I thought that Hildebrand and Innocent would hold undisputed power till the end of time, but I looked again, and the tiara was tarnished, 
the peoples had revolted, the Reformation had come." Unquote. Standing amid another century, his word would be, quote, I saw absolutism, irresponsible personal government in full flower, in the person of a Charles or a Louis, but I looked again, and what a ferment! The air was electric, the earth shook, the rain descended, and the floods came and beat upon the lofty towers of pride, and a cry went up, Babylon the Great is fallen, unquote. The democracy had come. Well, let some Methuselah travel down the centuries and watch their changes, the exits and the entrances, and surely every little while he would exclaim, I saw no temple. I saw the new constantly transcending the old. I saw that all things were in motion, and that passing away was written upon the world and its contents. I saw human thought poured from vessel to vessel, and human nature taking on different vestures. It seems to be the fact that thus far man has attained unto nothing which is more than relatively good and serviceable. The world is like an old garret, filled with belated furniture, hair trunks, ancient andirons, grotesque bonnets and fans, wheezy clocks, faded pictures and screens, cordless harps, outlandish apparel, forgotten literatures, dusty antiquities, and discarded rubbish. How much has been left behind? How much spoiled wheat and cumbrous baggage has been thrown overboard on the long voyage? How much has served its day and fallen asleep? How much once indispensable has been shelved and is gathering green mold? I saw no temple therein. What a tremendous truth it is! The things that are seen are temporal. The great world has its sunsets as well as the solar day, and there have already been many of them. It has its seasons like the year, its budding springtimes and its gorgeous autumns. It has its tides like the sea, high water mark and low water mark. It has its phases like the moon, now full, now sickle-shaped, now gibbous. It changes with man. It bespeaks his character. It betrays his bias. All its processes reflect his preference. Whatever disappears does so because, on the whole, man does not like it. Whatever arrives comes to answer some human call. If anything drops out, it is not sorely needed. Its power has waned, its necessity is no longer apparent, or it can be refashioned to suit the new exigency. The wine can be poured into new and stouter skins that can bear the ferment and attention better. But John's vision has another aspect and application. As already stated, it aptly describes the collective experience of the race thus far migrating perpetually out of one civilization and social order into a succeeding. But there is more in it than that, for it seems to teach that the soul of man is destined to come into nearer relation to the living God, the supreme reality. This expectation and high density are expressed under a figure, no temple, that is to say that man's knowledge of God and of the universe is on the way to more subtle refinements and a clearer definition. It is practically the same idea that burst upon Paul. Quote, now we see in a mirror darkly, then face to face. Now I know in part. Unquote. A magnificent prospect it is that the infinite God and the moral problems of this unintelligible world and of existence as a whole shall take on new shapes, divulge new meanings. Man at present is densely ignorant touching the highest topics of human thought, including his own possibilities. He apprehends all religious truth through the medium of crude, inadequate definitions and material symbols. The supreme realities loom upon us big, vague, dim as through a thick fog. We catch a glimpse of them, but do not see them as they are. Relative to the ideas of God, of spiritual perfection, and of eternal life, Man is an Eskimo, dwelling among icebergs and polar cold and the twilight air of a frozen zone, but according to Christian prophecy he is yet to dwell near the equator, in a tropical, aromatic, soft summer land and under the vertical splendor of divine truths. He is to revolve in a larger orbit and nearer the throne of God. If so, it would seem to follow that while the Bible, the Church, the frame and constitution of nature, the course of providence, all the appointments of this present state, are unquestionably commensurate with the requirements of man as he now stands, yet a crisis is coming, an epoch will dawn, when this may not be quite so true, because he shall be furnished with a more powerful organism, with a more sensitive nerve, with finer fiber and a larger cerebral capacity, so to speak, and more rapid and intuitive perceptions and greater receptivity, 
and by reason of this his increased volume of being shall be able to receive and use what is now incomprehensible. I saw no temple therein. Why not? Probably because there was no longer need for one. I can think of no better reason. It appears to be a prophecy of the yet undeveloped and potential life of man's soul, under some future, inconceivable conditions which await him, when God shall make himself more audible and articulate than now, at least to those who wait for him. John's predictive vision, then, seems to foreshadow a radical change in those forms and statements in which religious ideas are now couched. No temple. Doubtless many of the old battle-grimed banners will be lowered, many tattered flags will be furled, many old war drums will cease to throb, many watchwords and shibboleths will fall empty and meaningless, many vestments, rituals, pompous sacerdotalisms, and considerable dogmatic theology mayhap will shrivel up and go to pieces in that day when the Lord God Almighty shall become the temple of a redeemed race. Much that now carries the air of supreme importance may then take a secondary rank. Quote, the last shall be first, and the first last, unquote. And to this dogma and to that form or ceremony it may be said, quote, friend, go up higher, unquote, or, quote, friend, give this man place, unquote. Indeed, it is impossible to gauge the dimensions and range of this enigmatic sentence, I saw no temple therein. If Columbus' discovery of America and the exploits of the 15th century navigators revolutionized geography, if the discovery of the circulation of the blood made an epoch in medicine, if the discovery of planetary motion altered the position of the earth among the family of worlds, if steam and the electric wire annihilate space and time, if these minor revelations, like a sunrise, have wakened mankind to new views and interpretations, how much more that high day when God shall manifest himself and open his universe more freely to man, when there shall be no need of a temple or of the symbolism, metaphor, and apparatus by means of which eternal things are now mediated. And if any one ask, Shall not my favorite theology hold good? Will there be no Bible, no church, no altar, no song, no sacrament in that holy empire of restored humanity, whenever and wherever it may arise? Possibly, but if so, not what befits this present scene, and man at his present stage of knowledge and hampered by his stringent limitations. I saw no temple therein, says the rapt seer of the apocalypse. It must mean something. And what else can it mean than this, that a vast organic change is yet to pass upon human nature, rendering obsolete and antiquated much that is now indispensable and useful? Verily, this is one of the spacious and splendid prophecies of the gospel, that man is destined to know more about God, about the true, the beautiful, and the good, about the mysterious universe that he is marching toward, a larger and finer brain, a more cunning hand, a purer heart, and a concord of more harmonious faculties. He is like a mariner on a tedious voyage. The stale biscuits will answer until he has cast anchor and goes ashore to eat the mellow fruits of the land. Something like this seems to be the teaching of John's vision, that, as the final outcome of present arrangements and after they have done their work, there will be a revelation of God to man, compared to which this earthly life is a dream, a twilight. A personal and living providence will then no longer be called a great perhaps, and the immortality of the soul will have become an axiom. The power and essential superiority of spirit will become manifest, rapid intuitions will take the place of tardy logic, probability will ripen into proof, and great truths, now disputed and doubtful, will have become as sure as sensation. Prayer, it may be, will take different expression. Praise will be different, worship, adoration, will migrate into other forms, all religious exercises may pass into another phase and take on another tone and complexion, when God and the Lamb are become the temple of the ransomed race. When, where, how, on this material globe or in some other firmament of immensity, these particulars are not given. It is prophecy, dim, glimmering, inorganic, shapeless, afloat in vacancy, steeped in silence, fringed with splendor. The Bible from Genesis to the Apocalypse rumbles all through with some unspeakable, tremendous, far-off event. It is like a promissory note that has not yet matured. It is like a fruit tree in springtime, full of eyes, swelling buds and opening blossoms, all ripening toward autumn. Here and yonder it flings up a Nebo, a Hermon, 
a beetling crag or high headland, from which one may look out and away toward the sunset of time as we know it, when man will be ripe and ready for an unveiling of the Godhead, and for a breaking of secrets that had not previously been possible, and the symbol will give place to reality. If this be at all a correct rendering, what a mere nursery filled with the clack and cries of nurses and children is the Christian church, compared to the adult, spiritual, and future state of redeemed men! Christian doctrine, too, say the best of it, how inadequate and unsatisfactory, how many raveled edges! Surely our creeds must be but angles of the truth, fractional parts, bearing the same relation to unseen reels that the debtor's fifty or sixty cents on the dollar bears to what he actually owes. All we can do yet a while is to take the likeliest materials at hand, and frame the most logical, coherent, moral, and satisfying conception of God and His requirements of which we are capable. Use what you have. Believe the gospel delivered to you. Take to heart its great promise and prophecy and live by it. This is the time for faith, for patience, for watching. We know enough to answer the present distress. God may not utter any more truth concerning himself yet a while. Go live by what is revealed in Jesus Christ. It is more than enough. He has power to forgive and to sanctify souls. He is the way of life. Do his commandments. Live in his spirit. Trust in his powerful blood. Forms, creeds, rituals come and go. No human theology can adequately translate eternal things. No form of worship, whether highly ornate and ceremonial or of the simple, silent sort, can lead one into the holy of holies. But we can do the will of God. We can hope in His mercy. We can work righteousness. We can act upon our best impulses. We can make articles of faith and forms of worship crutches to lead us to a higher landing and to immense horizons. We can believe, obey, and glorify God. We can name the name of Christ and become his disciples. This is enough now. This is all that is possible now. All life is progress from lower to higher, from accident to essence, from symbol to reality. As man moves forward, this and that drops away, superfluities are discarded, and substantial values are kept. I saw no temple therein. They need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light. It is the same truth in a different phrase. Life is in its best sense an everlasting progress and ascension, along the course of which this and that falls aside outworn, preposterous, puerile, as the soul waxes in power and reaches a higher altitude and draws nigh unto God. Meantime we need the sun and the moon and the temple. Systems and creeds, forms and ceremonies, these are fixtures of the present time. Use them for what they are worth. Get all the good out of them they contain. And grow in grace. End of chapter 8 End of Seeing Darkly